Chapter 3 Dante could have used my commute home as a companion piece to the Inferno. The additional police, NTSB, FBI, and Homeland Security checkpoints swelled the usual 25-minute haul to Quincy up to, no joke, two years. I don't mind long drives, but that meant road trip kind of drives. Windows down, music cranked, open road drives. Long city drives are the exact opposite. 30 minutes of stop and go traffic feels like being fit for a casket. Three hours to trek a route that usually took less than a half hour felt like being buried alive with a thousand other screaming assholes that each hated their lives as much as you did in that particular moment. Eternity passed and familiar silhouettes finally loomed in from the end of my dead end street. Backdrop by a silvery moon, the sleek shapes of my neighbors gave a warm welcome. I breathed a sigh of relief. Home. The aircraft boneyard at the Squantum Point Naval Museum was the last place on earth anybody would figure a rogue mage called home. Anybody aligned with the arcane must hate all things mechanical and Star Trek-y, right? Wrong. I've trained in the essence and its various disciplines and applications, lay folk collectively call them magic, since I was 13. But that didn't mean I was as hooked on my smartphone as the next guy. Tires crunched gravel as I maneuvered my pickup down the winding service roads beyond the museum's visitor center. I exchanged greetings with the rows of skeletal World War II aircraft, giving them lazy salutes as I passed. Like most venerable things in a world of shortened attention spans, the fleet of old planes had fallen prey to neglect. Mother Nature had marked her territory with rusty streaks, blue-green molds, and tall grasses that strangled cockpits through shattered windows. I've been living aboard a decommissioned Douglas C-54 Skymaster for the past two years. A friend of my grandfather's, whose Navy uniform sported more tin than a cannery, had called in a favor when I'd been out of options. It took some getting used to, but I managed. I parked nose out, killed the engine, and stepped down from the truck. A spasming knot whipped my back like a a dollar-a-minute dominatrix, and I fantasized of sleeping for a month. I scanned my surroundings out of habit, then grabbed my backpack from the back seat. Thankfully, the boneyard spoke only in whispering winds and chattering crickets. I'd rigged up the floodlights with motion sensors at key points around my C-54 a month after I'd moved in. Back then, it had been to warn off teenagers looking for a hangout. Given the fate stealer's cryptic warning, I felt even better about having them and some other key defenses. Nothing too dangerous, just the usual anti-personnel rigs. Magical flares to blind and disorient. Repulsion zones that made trespassers nauseous if they strayed too close. Mendaports that randomly transported people elsewhere, and some mundane snares I'd learned from the Crimson Glaive. I'd walked to the carcass of a P-51 Mustang fighter sleeping nearby, grabbed a handful of wing, and hauled myself up. Leaving the canopy open for a quick exit was old hat. Now, my getaway vehicle wasn't a 60-year-old half-skeletal plane, although I extended my senses, felt the familiar presence of the spell I'd cast on the cockpit, the ingressy portal was one of the first spells my grandfather had insisted I'd learned. The most important part of any plan was the escape route, because the rest of it usually falls apart in the first few seconds, Nathaniel Winters had always said. I infused the spell with fresh effort of will for upkeep, then headed home. Hey, Dougie, I said to the Douglas Aircraft Company C-54. I dragged the wheeled staircase into position and climbed up to the door near the plane's tail end. I fished a key from my pocket, and before inserting it, I ran through the mental obstacle course symbolizing the defensive warns I'd cast on the old bird. I'd done the glaive's dirty work for a better part of a decade, and it made more enemies than I cared to remember, so you'll have to forgive me for being cautious. Defensive wards were simple enough for any novice practitioner. Simple but powerful. Deadly if you wanted to go that route. Some mages preferred the timeless jolt of electricity, others jetting gouts of flame. I preferred avoiding charred corpses on my doorstep. Go figure, but that kind of thing tends to attract the wrong sort of attention. My wards hit like a heavyweight boxer's haymaker. Effective, but not overstated. I disarmed the wards and the air sizzled with dissipating power. When my skin finished prickling, I unlocked the double-wide cargo door to Casa de Winters. I flipped on the lights, rearmed the wards, and dropped my backpack beside the door. I liked leaving my gear within easy reach. You see a recurring motif here? Dull light filled the plane, lighting my apartment with suffused glow. The hundred-foot-long plane had soared the friendly skies of World War II as a flying hospital for the U.S. Army. The cargo hold and troop seating had been stripped to accommodate stacks of hanging litters for wounded soldiers. A flight nurse's station occupied the rear of the cabin and served as my kitchen. It had a sink, microwave, and hot plate. I periodically changed the plane's batteries with the help of a generator I, air quote, borrowed from the Naval Museum. 
a working lavatory occupied an adjacent corner. Showers were a work or gym kind of situation. It's about as ideal as you'd expect. I installed a few strategic pieces of painted drywall to cordon off a master bedroom by the cockpit. There wasn't much in there, mattress, nightstand, and a metal folding chair doubling as a laundry rack. It had taken eight hours. Apparently, mastery of the arcane doesn't include a mastery of Allen wrenches, but I managed to assemble one of those anybody-can-do-it closets from Ikea and installed it on the wall facing the door. A rectangular mirror covered one of the doors. The main living space was more homey. The walls were plastered with vintage movie posters. Jaws, Psycho, Indiana Jones, Rocky. Mismatched lamps occupied a couple of mismatched end tables. They flanked a second-hand couch whose print made it look straight from the 70s, but was comfortable enough for a good nap. A beat-up armchair that had quit on reclining way back when sat in opposition to the couch. It wasn't perfect, but it was home. Honey, I'm home, I said. Laura? Carol? Peg? Hey, if a guy couldn't talk to his fictional TV wives, who could he talk to? The fridge door rattled open and I scavenged for something not a month beyond sell-by date. I settled on a beer. A bubbly voice with a hint of breezy Nebraska cornfield said, You know I hate when you talk about other girls, fella. I smiled. And you know I like when my best girl is waiting up for me. I closed the fridge and caught the tail end of Ava's materialization. A pulse of matted silver light flashed a few feet above my couch, and Ava lowered her vaporous form into a comfortable curl at the couch's end. The ghost's details resolved in shades of pearlescent silvers, blacks, and whites that gave Ava the look of a person who'd stepped out of an old black-and-white television show. Tall in life, Ava had the sinewy cut of somebody familiar with manual labor. She wore a sundress that had been canary yellow when she'd been buried. Her hair was styled in the victory rolls you'd find in the old World War II recruitment posters. The ghost's manifestation flickered occasionally like a skipping film reel. Ava tucked her knees under her chin and folded her fingers across them. I heard about what happened. Are you okay? How? I don't have a TV and I'm pretty sure you're not on social media. You squares in your book faces and tweeters. Whatever happened to meeting people in the flesh? It's got to be a better time than sitting in front of a screen. Got a lot of experience in that department, do you? I asked sarcastically. Ava gave me a pouty smile. She would have been very easy to look at in her heyday. A lady never kisses and tells, Jacob Winters. I'd have thought Nathaniel would have taught you that. My grandfather mostly stuck to the basics. Shave with the grain, cold iron bullets for the she, silver blades for the whites, those kind of things. I took a swig and rubbed my stubbled scalp. I could still taste the bitter scent pouring from the bus. It was more of the same. Silence, then screams, blood, tears, I said. You wouldn't think it possible, but the ghost's face darkened. Were there any? I only saw one kid, I said. Ava quickly crossed herself, another thing you probably wouldn't expect a ghost to do. Did, did you get to them in time? I know it's not your job, Jake, but some impulses you can't turn off. I nodded. I did what I could. You checked for a pulse in more than one place? Ava asked. What about his eyes, Jake? Please tell me you checked his pupils. About the last thing I wanted was a debriefing. Anger bubbled in my chest. Now who can't turn it off? It's been, what, 80 years since you were with the Army Nurse Corps? I spat. I told you, basic combat medicine was day one stuff at the Crimson Glaive. They're pretty intent on keeping operators alive, given our scarcity. You don't think we just rolled through the forever scape without taking casualties, did you? Ava's eyes narrowed to dark slits. My spine wobbled. It was easy to forget she wasn't really a 19-year-old flight nurse. Don't you dare lecture me on casualties. I saw things on the front line in France that would curdle your blood. I shivered. Goose flesh prickled my arms. I took another swig, hoping I'd shown something like 110% less fear. I guess we've all seen some things, right? I'm sorry. Ava's expression brightened to its normal sterling. The boy's okay, then? I nodded. It was a fate stealer. I gave him a dimensional boot back to that shithole of a swamp they call home. I shifted uncontrollably, remembering the child's psychic wounds. I handled the fate stealer and left the kid with his dad, I said. But... The ghost frowned. She released her knees from under her chin and sat a little straighter. But when I saw them again ten minutes later, the kid was on a backboard with EMS, and the father was tuning up some guy's jaw and taking off in a Mercedes. What kind of man leaves his boy in the middle of that insanity? Ava clenched her fists tight enough for tiny spectral wisps to curl free. I'd have given him a right piece in my mind. I finished my beer telling Ava what the fate stealer had said about the widespread interest in the winter's bite between poles. That's not good, Jake, she said. Gets better. The Crimson Glaive may already be coming. Ava's eyes widened as they flickered. Merciful Lord, what are you going to do? 
For now, nothing. I've laid out some early warning wards on the roads leading in. Should give me plenty of time to bail if need be, I replied. That might not be good enough, Ava said, folding her arms. The Crimson Glaive isn't how you remember them. Old pain crushed my chest. They've been shouting, rushing to pack the car. A dark road, too dark. An icy bridge. And falling. I blinked hard. I remember just fine. No, you don't. They're 100% bad news now, Jake. They're already halfway from Resistance Group to Terror Network when you and Nina left them. Now, now they're out for Unity Blood at any price. They don't care who gets in the way, mortal or immortal. Doesn't matter. I frowned. Grumblings of Crimson Glaive escalation against the Unity and their mortal puppets like the Radiance have been why I'd stolen the Winter's Bite in the first place. Left unchecked, such escalation inevitably became a magical arms race. The Unity had decisively crushed humanity with the Severance the last time that war had been fought. What else did they have stashed for a rainy day in case another war broke out? Maybe next time they wouldn't settle for taking only our magic. The Crimson Glaive had formed shortly after the Severance. They fought to recover humanity's connection to the Essence, our birthright. They fought for freedom. Birthright or no, I couldn't let something like the Severance happen again, and that meant keeping the Crimson Glaive in their own weight class, even if it killed me. A throb invaded my skull and I slouched into the couch. When I opened my eyes, Ava was hovering above me, our nose separated by less than a foot. If I hadn't been so exhausted, I might have jumped. You want me to stick around for a while? Keep first watch? Ava asked. I glanced at my wristwatch. Yeah, I'm old school like that. I draped the crook of an elbow over my mouth and yawned. No, you better split. Sun's going to be up in a couple hours. I've been doing this whole ghost routine for twice as long as you've been alive. I know the rules, mister, Ava said curtly. Those rules were serious business. Sunlight and beings from other places don't mix. Oil and water, toothpaste and OJ, bleach and ammonia. All better combos than spiritual beings and sunlight. I once saw a demon prince burnt to absolute ash in the span of seven seconds when he got trapped outside during daybreak. A simple spirit drifting between worlds like Ava wouldn't last exactly a heartbeat. I puckered my lips and gave her a raspberry. God forbid something happens to you. Who else am I going to split the rent with around here? Smart Alec, Ava said. She gave me a peck on the forehead. It tingled. I'll be in bed if you want to talk, Ava said. The offer was appreciated, but I was wrecked and had no words for emotions better off, dead and buried. Thanks, but my bed's calling too. The ghost smiled, then melted into a miasma of steam-colored tendrils. The cloud corkscrewed toward the kitchen and passed into one of the framed photos hanging above the wall-mounted desk. It was a picture of Ava and her friends in their nurse corps uniforms. The old photo was tinged with yellow, but Ava's uniform had gallantly maintained a shade of ivory white despite time's passage. Ava had been the lone surviving nurse when her C-54 had been shot down over occupied France. She and one of the flight crew had held off German forces for two days until the Allies rolled in for the save. All told, she'd saved 18 wounded patients from capture. Ava died a few days later from her wounds. She'd been 19. We made for good roommates, given our mutual familiarities with war zones, and I felt like we would have been friends in any time period. Some people you just had that connection with, that unspoken nod that said, I know, I got you covered. I stretched onto the couch, took a sip of beer I really didn't want, and picked up the lone picture on the end table. My could-have-been wife, Nina, and our daughter Chloe during a trip to Point Sebago Lake, Maine. Chloe had been six. It would have been a good day. Maybe the best day. I lingered on the picture for a breath, then gently placed it face down. The MBTA disaster drained my reserves. I couldn't sort the emotions riding shotgun with Chloe's photo. My eyes drifted to the cabinet above the kitchen sink. I'd stashed something precious there, a treasure, in an alcove I had built behind a false lip. Stealing the winter's bike couldn't make up for what had happened to my Chloe, but if it meant the Crimson Glaive couldn't harm another child, snatching it from them would be worth suffering any consequence. The half-empty beer didn't object when I abandoned it beside the photo. My eyes burned and felt like somebody was tugging their lids down. I splashed some water from the kitchen sink on my face, brushed my teeth. An uneven spot on the floor outside my bedroom door creaked underfoot, same as always. My mess of a mattress looked more appealing than the presidential suite at the Waldorf or Astoria. I removed my pistol from my waistband, flicked the safety off, and placed it on the nightstand. I stripped down to my shorts, leaving my clothes on the folding chair with an easy reach. All part of that quick exit plan I've been touting. A notification blinked on my phone. I grunted my approval at the message. The day before my raid on the Crimson Glaive, I'd called in a marker and secured a safe house in case things got too hot. The broker had made final arrangements and was ready to receive me. One less thing to worry about, I guess. I took a plastic fob, 
the last part of my emergency plan from the nightstand drawer and palmed it. The little boy and his terrified father flashed to mind as I flopped down. I don't remember my face hitting the pillow.